Do you see ocular migraines with POTS? Let's talk about migraine in general with POTS. Migraine is a bit of a tough diagnosis because we get different things lumped into it, whether there's pain or not. But generally speaking, when we start talking about ocular migraines, vestibular migraines, abdominal migraines, hemiplegic migraines, what we're kind of getting to in these cases is we're talking more about alterations to blood flow in a particular region. So uh, ocular migraine tends to come either in the eye, but more often in the occipital lobe, where when we start to actually create, you can think about it like a spasm in the blood vessel, like we talked about earlier, but it gets, it makes it so that the vessel gets small. And so the resistance of how hard you got to push the blood through goes up. You have to push it a lot harder to try to get it through. Therefore, it doesn't go through as easily. And then that can yield a migraine on the other end of that, right? So in this case, if you're talking about an ocular migraine, it's just telling you about the region where that's happening. And sometimes that's going to be in the eye itself where it's affecting the retina. But some people will also call it an ocular migraine if we're having it causing visual problems that are coming from the visual cortex or even to some degree in the in the projections going back there so there's a little bit of trickery or nuance in in making sure that you understand where it's at that's kind of easy to figure out um but what is the overlap of those and i'm going to include vestibular migraine i'm going to include um hemiplegic migraine in those as well because there's a lot, a lot of overlap there and abdominal migraine as well and you're you're kind of like really hitting on a very important point because what we're saying with POTS is POTS is this response to this type of a problem, right? So if I have, if I'm trying to push fluid through a tube, right? Picture like a thick milkshake. If I'm trying to push more fluid through that tube, but the tube is smaller, I got to push harder. And we, all we can really do is, is either constrict the vessel down, which it's already doing, or increase the power coming from the heart. So in many, many, many cases, when we're thinking about tachycardia, and in this case, POTS, it's an elevation of the heart rate in order to try to overcome the resistance to blood flow. So if we're having, there's a high, there's gonna be a high correlation between people that are experiencing different types of migraines and people that are experiencing POTS because you're gonna see that cardio acceleration as a way to try to break through the migraine. So um, I hope that's useful. And there's a ton and ton, a ton of overlap. You can see them really well on transcranial Doppler, looking at the pulsatility indices, um, looking at even just simple bedside things like red saturation testing can be really useful. Looking at hyperventilation testing can also induce those spasms, so to speak, um, and help point out where, where a lot of those things are. Just a follow up question regarding my eyes. I think Issue is ocular alignment when static. Is it worthwhile for me to change my prescription or it won't help because of the ocular alignment issue? So again, not specific medical advice. Um, my suspicion would be to start there. And if so, using some simple eye exercises and eye head exercises may help you be able to figure out how to recuperate that system in a way where your vision might get a little clearer which could be pretty cool as far as changing the prescription you're still going to be that static alignment may still be an issue but you know it just depends on like how much you're willing to spend on the test for the glasses so like in other words like i can test changing my prescription see if i like it or not see if it changes if it doesn't then it was a test you know now and you know they might not be good useful for you um, why is using subtitles or typing in chats setting off my seizures? Doctor suggests it's the content triggering my emotions. I believe it's the movement as it doesn't happen unless I look at a screen. Smart cookie. Absolutely. It's not always emotions. Sometimes it's just the mechanics of motion. And scrolling, reading can be things that are active, highly activating the visual cortex, highly activating in the frontal cortex, where if that's where your seizures are, you might be onto something. Smart, smart. Worth having a conversation about. You can also do testing where they do prov provocative testing. I don't love that for you because it's gonna provoke a seizure, but you can get down to the end of it. Um, talk to your doctor. My eyesight sucks since POTS. Okay, technical word. 
along with the <laughs> increase in gray hair, but that's for another day. Reading glasses are worn all the time, all day. Can I improve my vision with tools like Brockstring? Can you combat, combat age-related decline in vision being via functional neurology? So here is the sad news is that we're all going to get worse eyes as we go along. We're going to get presbyopia over time. Uh, I'm waiting for the days. I always check like this. My wife makes fun of me because I do oculomotor exams all day long and I'll use a Snellen chart and we'll use fancy eye testing. And then I will go myself when we're in Costco and just kind of go sneak over there. And my eye exam is just checking the readers and making sure that I can still see. Um, so she gives me a real hard time with that as she should. Um, but you can use some eye, eye exercises and here's why. So a lot of age related decline is actually due to the flexibility of the lens. Somebody earlier was talking about um, with atherosclerosis, like that placking or the stiffness in the artery, we can get stiffness in the lens of the eye, which makes it so that as we move in and out, it makes it harder for that lens to constrict. And when that lens doesn't constrict as well, it makes it harder for us to see up close. Sometimes it can be because we have a harder time being, bringing our eyes together, but more often than not, when we're looking at just presbyopia, it's because that lens can't bend in enough to be able to make that object clear up in front. Um, and that can be related to having like a lot of people that work at one distance uh, and are working a lot near may find that as you move even closer, that's got to kind of start to move out. Um, you can work on that by being able to work on the lens. There, there are some interesting things if you just go into PubMed and search that. There are some exercises people do just with looking at near and far rocking where you're moving your eyes in and out. You're talking about bead string or using an accommodation tool where you're like a heart chart where you're near and far and just the flexibility of asking that lens to bend and flex more can be useful. Some people will do things where they kind of palm their eyes and um, I don't know to what degree that I've, I've looked for research studies on that. It's a little bit uh, undecided in terms of how helpful it is, but it feels nice. Might not be a bad idea. Might bring a little blood flow to your eyes as well. And then being able to do visual exercise games where you're getting outside and having that nice far vision and, and then contrasting that with near vision as well. For how long does stroke may show on images? Like, does the image need to be done the same day or even after years when brain images are done? Can you still see a stroke happen at some point? Good question. So when you look at something like an MRI, pretty quickly, especially in stroke, you can see if there's either blood where it's not supposed to be. That's very easy to see because it looks, it's fluid versus brain tissue. So you can see that pretty well. If that's if you're bleeding. Or if it's ischemia where we're cutting off blood supply then you can see that there's a penumbra where that tissue's injured, where you basically get tissue that was choked off and then it starts to die. And you can see those scars or you can see the inflammation in the acute stages. And then over time, particularly if you're looking at a CT, you may see that that, that swelling or that inflammation kind of goes down and you get just like a normal scar would work where uh, it starts out big and then it kind of shrivels up and shrinks up and tightens down. So typically you can see them for quite a while afterwards, but it'll change over time. And a lot of times people's records will say that it's, you know, that it's shrunk or that it's stabilized. So you can see them typically um, if you're worried that, you know, you've had one and you look at that MRI, usually if there's still damage or you can see it. Now, if someone had a TIA, which was a transient ischemic attack, it may be bad enough to where it landed you in the hospital or made you really symptomatic, but it didn't damage the tissue enough that it shows up on an MRI. So that would be kind of the outlier to that question. Rob had noted that um, symptoms drive anxiety and depression, get rid of symptoms, then happy days. My friends keep pushing me to see a therapist. Not sure how that helps when they can't fix my symptoms. I think that's that's the trouble. I have this conversation a lot because I do think um, so like I, I had someone special to me that had a stroke and so when you're having a stroke, you're just like living your life and then you wake up in the hospital and your life is way different. And we always talked about the fact that no one was ever there in the hospital at that time to be able to provide any counseling that was like, yeah, 
Like this is different. Let's let's sort this out. Let's let's work through it. Um, and and so that means like I don't know that for a lot of people counseling is the solution per se. Although for some people it's wonderful. Um, I think I think a lot of it is just like the ability to sort out like how you're dealing with a particular thing so that you can keep it in check. And then run that in a parallel track with then trying to solve for it. And being able to do that thing can be empowering because you you have the the control in that situation. And sometimes if we're left to our own devices, we kind of start to feel out of control. And that it can be a, a time where we're talking to somebody can be useful. But I think you're looking this through through a clear lens in the sense that like you, you understand where it's coming from. Maybe you're managing it well. Um, but yeah, I think, I think maybe that's not going to fix it, but it may be a way to help you just like to cope or to deal with it in the meantime so that you're able to, to keep focused and, and keep pushing forward.